Um, before I introduce our chef today, and we get going on um, learning a little bit about what she's doing because it's pretty amazing. A couple of quick announcements. Uh, first of all, welcome everybody. Secondly, you know, I was just giving a, a report the other day about how things went for the Feed the Planet Committee in 2020. And there was one statistic that jumped out at me. Um, and that is that in 2020, we had 1,033,000 impressions around the world in terms of all the activities that we're doing. And that was um, huge. You know, so we at World Chefs and at Feed the Planet, along with our you know, partners of Isaac and the Electrolux Food Foundation, we're, we're pushing this ball forward. And, um, and much of it is with your help and involvement. So thank you. Uh, we will continue doing the monthly webcasts like this. So, so stay tuned. Um, and then lastly, in March, we're planning a meetup, a virtual meetup for the train the trainers of the sustainability curriculum. So more on that coming up. Uh, we're going to start kind of knitting that community of trainers together and we can learn from each other, um, et cetera. So with that, I'm going to jump right into what we're doing here today. I know people are still checking in, um, but keep keep coming in and, and we're just going to we're going to begin to keep things on schedule. So. First of all, um, I am so pleased to have a chef from India joining us today, not only because she's amazing, and I'm gonna tell you about that in a second, but also I have a huge love of India and of Indian food. And as we were talking earlier, I haven't had breakfast yet. And like talking about Indian food, it really has a soft spot in my heart. And for those of you who have maybe never been to India, I strongly encourage you to go at some point because it is really um, one of the great cuisines of the world and incredibly complex, incredibly diverse. And I could wax on poetically for a long time about Indian food, but I'm a gigantic, gigantic fan. So let me introduce our guest today. Um, Chef Radhika Kandewal um, moved to Melbourne, Australia at 17 to pursue psychology. So you can tell us what's wrong with all of us afterwards, but anyways. <laughs> and then she started working at a fine dining restaurant to kind of support herself. And I've heard this story a thousand times and all of a sudden, boom, there's the passion. And you're gonna, you, you're gonna hear from her in a minute and she is so absolutely passionate about what she does. So she returned to India in 2013. She founded Radish Hospitality, opened up a couple restaurants, Ivy and Bean, and then Fig and Maple. Um, and both of these restaurants, especially Fig and Maple, which we're gonna talk about, was founded on a canvas um, of basically showcasing the vast biodiversity of India, which is really vast, and, and getting involved in local seasonal and lesser known ingredients, which is what we've talked about in the Feed the Planet world for so long. So the arrival of Fig and Maple in Delhi marked the beginning of really a new movement in sustainability, uh, in Delhi and was then you know, adopted by other chefs. And we're gonna talk about her role as a leader. Uh, but uh, Chef Radhika also is an advocate uh, of sustainability and a member of the Chef's Manifesto. And we've worked with them closely on numerous things. And she's been working to fulfill the objectives of the SDG 2, which is hunger. And you launched a 45 day campaign, uh, which was titled B, excuse me, um, Zero Waste Hero, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, and that raised awareness of hunger, biodiversity, climate change, food waste, etc. And not only is she a chef, and not only is she running restaurants and about to start service, we got to stay on the, on the track here. Um, but she's also a you know, food security activist, has spoken at the World Economic Forum, uh, the 75th UN General Assembly, and of course, has been featured in a ton of publications, you know, Vogue India, Condé Nast, The New York Times, The Economic Times, GQ India, Need I Go On. But most importantly, and Chef, after today on your bio, you can add that you are an esteemed guest on the Feed the Planet webcast. I mean, you know, New York Times, what's that? But, you know, <laughs> this is really where it's at. Anyways, um, Chef, uh, a huge uh, welcome from all of us in the Feed the Planet uh, community. So thanks for being with us. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. So one of the things I love about you, which we're going to get to in a little bit, is that you are 
about action. And, and we're going to get to this in a second, but we always talk about in World Chefs that, you know, it's not enough to know. It's not enough to learn. But, but that has to move us towards, towards action, um, et cetera. But before we get to that, Chef, tell me just briefly your sort of culinary journey. You went to Australia. I also saw in your bio, not in your bio, but I saw online you were going to be a hairdresser. Yes. How did this wind up in the kitchen? Um, I, I knew that I wanted to do, do something creative with my life, but my parents were very like, oh, you got to like follow the academic part and all of that. So psychology had to happen, but uh, alongside I joined a hairdressing course and I'm actually a certified trained hairdresser as well. Um, I, ha I have not practiced at all <laughs> before <laughs> anyone says, hey, can you cut my hair um, or can you help us with something? Uh, no, I, I'm not a trained psychologist. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a practicing psychologist. I'm not a pr uh, practicing uh, hairdresser. But uh, alongside, I did start uh, working to support myself. I started as a server and uh, it was just from service to kitchen and the minute I went to a kitchen, I knew this is it. And I actually had a great chef who was uh, mentoring me and helping me. And um, I did my apprenticeship and boom, <laughs> chef. <laughs> that's that's amazing. But as you say, hairdresser, I'm, always, I'm now looking at my computer screen like, oh boy. <laughs> uh, anyways. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your sustainability journey because you, you know, for all of us in, in you know, the food business, our sustainability journey starts somewhere. How did that start with you? And how did that happen? Just give us a kind of a look back a little bit. Um, what actually triggered the, my sustainability journey was the ugly food movement in Australia. So I'm talking back in like 2010 when it was just like there were hoardings all over the campaigns about you know picking up ugly food and um, why don't you pick up the ugly carrot first and blah 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 and i started doing that but uh, i also started deep diving into numbers and asking questions and uh, then that is when i realized that okay you know it, this makes more sense than you know just a hoarding or I started understanding the reasons behind practicing it. And um, there was also a buy local, um, an eat local campaign, which is really, really strong in Australia, support your farmers, blah, blah, blah. I was, I was really, really young then. So I didn't fully understand the reasons why. And I know it had a lot to do with them supporting the economy. And, you know, um, there's such a, self-sustaining economy Australia is and um, but how it kind of stayed with me and I came back to India I wanted to start working with farmers and you know supporting local and you know, buying local and have an all local restaurant but it wasn't as easy because when I came back it wasn't like I knew the vendors here or I'd um, you know studied here and had contact so it, it took me a good couple of years to finally find farmers vendors etc who would work with me or uh, you know who I could support or you know have that relationship going in first place um, after about three years of Ivy and Bean I knew that I need to do more and uh, I started planning Fig and Maple and uh, I knew the cornerstones of Fig and Maple have to be sustainability it has to be biodiversity and zero waste and um and it has to be delicious but it has to be sustainable so and that's exactly the path i went down so who did you learn from i mean so you come back from australia right and you're like i i think this is important i think this is something i need to do you come back to india and i remember you you told me previously that there really wasn't an infrastructure in place to do what you wanted to do how did you learn to do this i mean was there a was there a mentor was there what were the resources to educate yourself the resources were very very limited in fact i think uh, for the first three years of me coming back from uh, australia i was living in like a world of my own I didn't even know another person who owned a restaurant so I was absolutely not part of the larger chef community which I am very much now and uh, I guess now it would have been much easier for me to deal with that but 
because I didn't know anyone, it was slightly more difficult. But um, it, incidentally, I met my farmer, um, one of my favorite farmers, in fact, um, because he had come and he was dining in at Ivy and Bean. And somehow we started chatting and uh, he came the next day with produce. And that's exactly how my network grew with farmers, etc. Which is almost like sort of accidental a little bit. Absolutely. And is it is it easier? I'm just curious, you know, this is this goes back a few years, but is it easier today for a young chef who wants to or, or, or an older chef who wants to do this? Is there more of an infrastructure in place? And and if not, how do you go about creating it? Because that's what you did. Um, I do think it is easier now. I feel like um, chefs who are already doing this are more approachable. Um, things are a lot more transparent. So um, if you see my menu, I have the names of all my vendors written down, which means that I want other people to also work with them. It's not a secret. It's very, very transparent. I'm supporting a local farmer. You can too. Please be my guest. Take my vendors details. That's really interesting. So it's about creating a chef community. Yeah. But what I love about this is, is that, you know, you come back from Australia, you know, you want to do this. It would have been really easy to give up. I mean, it would have been really easy just to be like, ah, you know, why am I going to have to you know, look for farmers and all this stuff? And, and I think one of the takeaways from your story, which I think applies to everybody else, is, you know, what do you do when you run into a roadblock? right? I mean, what do you do when it's not easy? What do you do? How do you keep going? How did you keep going? You, you talk to people, you look at options, you try to contact them through whatever means. Like now you have Instagram and stuff where like you have access to people. Um, when, um, when I came back, there was only Facebook and uh, I was not even very active. So it was, it was challenging for me. And in fact, uh, this particular farmer who I just spoke about, I had messaged him on Facebook, but he kind of ignored me. So the conversation didn't go anywhere till the time he didn't come in and dine. So the moral of the story is here, if one thing doesn't work, try something else. <laughs> <laughs> First thing and, is key, key, basically. <laughs> Because it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, as, as I look at all the different people who have joined us today and from the different parts of the world, there are parts of the world where that sustainability infrastructure is much more in place and others where it's really not. And, and for those chefs, it's a lot harder, but, but I think your message is a good one, which is don't, don't give up, you know, find a way to connect. Yeah. So. All right, so let's let's sort of jump to now. You have you know two restaurants, so Ivy and Bean and Fig and Maple. Now Ivy and Bean has closed, right? Okay, so you have Fig and Maple right now, and so Fig and Maple that was founded on this concept of biodiversity, zero waste, etc. So let's talk for a little bit about the zero waste piece because at World Chefs we focused a lot on food waste. And we know that if you address food waste, you tend to address a lot of the other sort of overriding issues. So how do you do it? <laughs> I mean, you know, let, let's get down to some, you know, some real advice pieces because, you know, a lot of people that's when they hear zero waste, it's like, oh, I could never do that. Tell us, how do you do it? What are your pieces of advice for all of us? Well, um, one, and I, I know I'm, a lot of people are not going to agree with me here, but one is, see, is it even worth saving? Are you spending more resources in saving something? Or is it just something which um, can't be saved? Like I tried something with peanut leaves the other day. I was like, oh my God, but they're edible. We must use it, blah, blah, blah. But it was so fibrous. I spent like two hours just trying to make it happen. It wouldn't happen. And I was like, no, this is just no. Mm -hmm. So if, if, it's, uh, if it's using more of your resources, then uh, not, then don't. <laughs> Other than that, 
curiosity. I think that's something which took me long and far because uh, now I just look at things. I'm like, is this edible? Is this not? If it is, how was it used? Was it ever used in our culinary heritage? Because we come from a heritage where zero way, I mean, we talk about zero waste right now, but it was never about that. It was just a way of life, right? Like pickling and fermenting. Our grandmothers did it, our great grandmothers did it. Hell, my neighbor still does it because uh, I went to work out on the roof this morning and there was like um, these black carrots fermenting and we do it ourselves. We do a black carrot kanji every winter and uh, it, it's just, it, these are just like ways of life which we somehow forgot between generations or we did not uh, bother to take them forward or um, duly note. That's really interesting. I, I love this this comment about maybe sometimes it's just not possible or that it consumes too much resources. You know, one of the things we've talked about in World Chefs is that everything is combined, right? You know, energy use and water use and all of this. And that's, that's a really interesting perspective I've not heard before. Um, I love the curiosity piece. And frankly, I love this looking back piece because our, our ancestors, to your point, they have, they had a lot of wisdom. Yeah. And but, you know, everything that we talk about right now, eating locally, uh, they used to. Everything was from uh, maybe 15, 20 mile radius. Um, eating seasonally, all their foods were seasonal. Oh, mustard in the winter. Yeah, there was a reason because it was harvested then. Or turnips at this point uh, in the winter. Yes, because they were harvested then. Uh, Water-based vegetables and fruit during the summer because they cool your body down. And now it's just, and the worst part is that we'll, the, all of these things are now available through the year. And that's what we should be questioning. Why am I getting watermelon in the winter? <laughs> yes, we should be. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so real, you know, earlier you told me about a cauliflower thing that you guys do little cauliflower dip tell me tell me a little because i think this is kind of instructive for how you look at waste so i feel like um and this is my advice to most chefs stop uh, describing what we are talking about as waste as waste especially on your menus nobody wants to eat that nobody wants to say hey this could have been in the dustbin but now it's going on your plate no <laughs> If you describe the dish as its flavors and uh, what it tastes like, and I think that's something we also discussed about the fish, right, uh, on our call. And uh, people, people are going to want to have that. I have a dish called skinny chipping on my menu, which is basically peels of vegetables, which is converted into chips. And it's served with uh, a dip made with cauliflower stock. But it's called skinny chipping with creamy cauliflower dip. It's not called, hey, peels, which were which belong to the bin, but now converted into chips and now you're eating and pay me some money. No. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, introducing um, waste as condiments is also a very, very interesting way of getting a response from your guests. Like I have uh, some burgers on my menu where uh, we use uh, watermelon rind relish or jackfruit seed hummus, things which would otherwise be trashed, but hey, it's coming as part of your burger. You were, you're you not gonna object. It's like, oh, I'm gonna have a chickpea burger, but with watermelon rind. And I'd describe it as a spicy, what cooling watermelon rind relish. And yeah, that's exactly what it is. It is not, hey, the stuff which was going into the bit. You know, so, so infusing with a little bit of marketing is not so bad. <laughs> Actually, think that sustainability is really badly marketed. And that's tell me more about why. What so? so tell me more about that because that's that's really interesting. I, I feel like the PR person behind zero waste and sustainability is just really really bad. And I I, I really do think that when we talk about food waste, like as a community, and we're like, hey, it's not waste; it's food. We are conditioned to, you know call it waste and all of that, but this is all edible and all those things, then why are we still referring to it as waste? I like that. 
We could call it food opportunities. Yeah. Or, or ancestral food traditions. <laughs> yeah. That's 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 really interesting. So um so so Lynn, make make a note of it. We're gonna start a new Feed the Planet marketing committee. Uh Chef, Chef Radica is going to be uh, chairing it. Thank you very much, Chef, for joining that. <laughs> uh, so tell us, tell us a little bit about the Zero Waste Hero piece that you did, this 45-hour. So uh, Be a Zero Waste Hero was my call to action for people and just like everyone, the unusual suspect, the usual suspect, the consumer, the chef, the anyone to come and join in and be like, hey, this is how we have been saving food or this is how we can or hey i'm happy to learn this and i have replicated this or now i'm not wasting my orange peel and i'm making this out of it and uh, surprisingly it was it was amazing the response was insane and um i may have started the campaign thinking i'm the champion but i learned so much because of the campaign like there were people sending me tips and tricks and their stuff and um i got the entire chef community involved people who were already working with zero waste or how they whatever little they were doing or whatever how much ever they were doing it was all incorporated from around the world and uh, the support was insane and uh, it actually went off really really well and what was shocking was that um, the insights on that grew massively through, through the pandemic. So people were going back to those posts and referring to them and using them as guidance and reference. And that was even more brilliant because you could see that people are starting to become a lot more mindful of how they were consuming. And and who was who was posting on this? Was it chefs or was it consumers or was it both? Both. Both. Very interesting. So we talk a lot about, you know, in the world chef community about the power of the white jacket, or in your case today, the black jacket. <laughs> but, <clears throat> you know, but basically the, 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 the power that, that chefs have in many countries um, to be seen as leaders. And, you know, clearly that's something that you have embraced is, you know, taking that mantle of leadership, both within you know, the, the professional community and within the consumer community. But could you just reflect a little bit about that? I mean, you know, how, how do you see your role as a leader today in India to solve, to help solve and influence sustainability and issues like hunger? Uh, well, in all honesty, there is a long way to go for chefs to have a seat on the table when and this is when i'm talking about like big food policy changes are concerned and uh, but at the same time you can see that by the end of it if my business can make profit whilst being sustainable then is it necessarily that hard a thing or is it something which i can incorporate into the system and lead the way and that's exactly what i'm trying to do and um, knock on wood uh, i have been able to kind of uh, do that and uh, from the get go in fact uh, because the cornerstone of fig and maple was sustainability but mm -hmm. um, saying that i would say that the consumer is still not ready for sustainability as much as they are still looking for delicious so i think that's the agenda we need to push along with being sustainable in the back end. And I know that chefs now are working hard to do that. At the end of the day, it is always about delicious. Yes. <laughs> I'm, lo I'm looking at some questions here. Um, I have a really interesting question for you, which is, which is how did you overcome your fear of talking to strangers? <laughs> which I love that question. <laughs> okay, this is actually very real to me because uh, I still remember it was four years ago and we had an event and uh, now this person's my friend, but uh, she forced me to come out and give a speech because it was a chef's table. And I went and hid on the chest freezer because I was, I, I did not like talking to strangers. But it was during the pandemic when I realized I have no option. <laughs> I've gotten a lot more comfortable. 
This is a this is great. All right, let me just see. I'm looking at some other uh, questions here. Um, so so the question is so I I like to know what does it take to apply zero waste in the food business. So how how do, what does that exactly mean to you? So it actually starts with you, goes down to your team, and it's it just becomes a process. So you and you have to start questioning every damn thing. For me, I started, um, and I told you this. I would wear my gloves and I would just start digging out the dustbins and be like, "How could you do this? How could you do this? How could you do this?" And I would start measuring the waste and. Uh, I, I would keep reinforcing the fact that there's so many people hungry and you want to throw all this good food away. And it kind of resonated with my team. And uh, now they come up with ideas on their own. And it's really, really heartening to see that. Because from a commie to a UT to a sous chef is now coming up with ideas on how we can use this and make it into a more appealing dish. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, there's another question here. This is coming from uh, one of our colleagues in the Philippines. Um, and first of all, he he thanks you for being super passionate about how you're approaching sustainability. Um, but his question is really about, so what is your government doing, you know, to spearhead food security and sustainable practices? And I would add to that. And how do you see your role in that? So um, I would uh, actually like to address this because um... I feel like every region has um, a different food waste problem. For India, it is a lot to do with infrastructure and logistics. For a lot of other countries, it's also the food which they purchase and they just dump, right? But mm -hmm. for us, it's it's a lot it, it's a lot more complicated because it is about how the food is being harvested, um, what happens on the field level, how it's being transported and how much is lost during then. Um, so I, I do think that the government is trying to make some reforms as far as logistics is concerned uh, from the last paper that uh, we have read. Um, what my role play is, I can, I can still just help on the consumer level, I can help buy the things from my farmer. I can buy in excess, I can preserve, I can make product, mm -hmm. I can sell, and I can advocate for other chefs, other people to join that movement. Awesome. Uh, I'm gonna have two, two more questions here and then I think we have to wrap up. Uh, do you look at packaging? So like, you know, when stuff's coming into your, into your restaurant, you know, how, how do you look at the, the packaging part of it? Is that something uh, you pay attention to? So uh, most of our farmers actually send stuff in very sustainable packaging. So it's either wrapped in newspapers or in cardboard boxes and they actually take back the cardboard boxes as well. So um, wow. that's uh, kind of taken care of. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Um, so what, this, is, this, is, this is a tough question. <laughs> so Joe, uh, good one here. So um, what do you do about customers wasting their food? Um, well, they actually don't waste as much as one would think. They do pack back a lot of their stuff. A, we encourage that. So we always tell them to take back whatever they don't, uh, they, whatever they don't use. Unfortunately, sometimes we have no option but to compost. So in other words, you, you, what we call in the United States, we give doggy bags or, you know, so they put them in little containers and take it home. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. This is great. Uh, oh my goodness, all of a sudden we're getting a million questions. <laughs> Chef, they love you. <laughs> I mean, all right, I think we're going to take one more and then I, I need to wrap it up because your dinner service is about to start. <laughs> you know, there's, um, hang on, let's uh, have you innovate new menu. <clears throat> oh boy. Uh, so there's a, there's a question here about consuming meat and you know um you know is serving and consume consuming meat still sustainable you know what can we as a chef do to stop you know sort of maybe over consumption I mean, it's linked to the pandemic here but let's just talk about meat production for a minute okay so i think okay so let me give you an example when i started friggin maple 
my menu was only 30% plant-based. Uh, at this point of time, it is 65% plant-based. It is, I think you can tie it down to biodiversity and discovering new ingredients, highlighting those ingredients in a beautiful way, turning the, I mean, like you've got to give your consumer that option of another flavor. If you're saying, okay, don't eat beef. So what should I have? Okay, why don't you try the jackfruit steak or the eggplant mm -hmm. cutlet or whatever, whatever you can. And, and I think that's where the creativity of a chef comes in. What can you replace it with? What, what is going to be as delicious to my guest? Excellent. So there's a bunch of other questions here, which I think I'm just going to answer quickly, uh, which is really around the, the, the marketing piece that you talked about with the food waste. And, and I think, you know, it's really about... If, if I understand, you know, our discussion is less about calling it out as, hey, this is food waste and more about, you know, it's food waste. But instead of calling it out on your menu, like I'm cooking with food waste, because <laughs> I think, chef, you'd be like, it's a bad, bad, bad PR, bad marketing, right? <laughs> is rather to, to make it, you know, make it sexy, make it sound delicious. I mean, when you talked about the seeds of the jackfruit, now all of a sudden I'm, I'm curious because I, you know, Oh, it's so <laughs> this is this is fascinating because everywhere else they throw them away that I'm aware of. So, anyways, well, listen, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this one up. Uh, we people have from had Sri Lanka people... would know that they actually do a jackfruit seed curry as well in Lanka. It's amazing. Well, this is yet another reason why I need to spend more time in India it's because oh my gosh, the the what you can learn, um, Chef. I know you're about to start. Um, uh, your dinner service. Any any really cool special you have going on tonight? I'm just curious. <laughs> I, I haven't eaten yet. Tantalize me. <laughs> I have a chef special menu which runs uh, monthly. So whatever new ingredients I, I'm working with, I put them on a menu for, for the month and then change it every month. <laughs> Excellent. Well, chef, I want to thank you for taking the time. Uh, I know this is a busy time of your day. And, you know, hearing from people who are you know in the trenches every day making this happen you know fighting the good fight but most importantly also you know running a business and you know making a profit which is so important right and at the same time being a leader um you know in your country that's it's it's so admirable we have been we've been blessed by our time with you today so um thank you so very very much and to everybody else who took the time, you know, time is a precious gift. I always say it's the most precious gift we all have. So thank you for joining once again and, and making this a true global community. It is, it is such a pleasure to see all of you. So with that, I wish you all a wonderful morning, a wonderful day, uh, chef, a wonderful evening service. And for our good friends in New Zealand and Australia, please go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much take care everybody and lynn and shout out to lynn of course who's the, the the magician behind it all manager of the feed the planet program uh for world chefs and is amazing thank you, thank you everybody Bye. take care chef thanks again bye-bye